Welcome to the Boneyard with Steve Robertson. As always, I am your good friend and host, Steve Robertson, here for our annual year in review show. That's right. Just two days left in 2023. It's been a great year for me personally and professionally, but it wasn't necessarily the best year for Mississippi State Athletics. But we're going to talk about some of the top moments today of the year, athletically, for Mississippi State. Uh, The thing that we hope for for 2024 is, of course, that we all have a great year personally and professionally. But we'd like to see the Bulldogs uh, have a better year on the fields and courts of play. We did have, again, some high moments in 2023. But I wouldn't say that 2023 was a great year for State in in many respects. But... um, I'm ready to put this one in the books. You know what I'm saying? We were also hopeful about football season. Things didn't go nearly as well as we'd hoped. We were hopeful for a bounce back in baseball. We didn't get that, so we're optimistic that uh, we can turn things around in 2024. We did make the uh, NCAA tournament on the men's and women's side, and of course, in soccer. Uh, so we feel great about those things, but uh, we all are happier when uh, we're competitive in everything. You know, it's like you think about those great years where, you know, we get to bowl games, we get to regionals, perhaps get to Omaha, and then in addition to that, we make the NCAA tournament. But um, it wasn't a great year. Let's just go ahead and establish that now. We're just going to kind of call it for what it is. First year with Zach Selman at the helm of Mississippi State, not an indictment on him by any stretch of the imagination. Sometimes it takes a little while to get going because you inherit a lot of coaches. And uh, he's made his first major hire uh, since being our athletic director here recently. So that's the way things sit. But uh, there were some things to cheer about. We're going to talk about that. But uh, my hope for you is you look back over the 2023 year and you think about so many great things that happened in your life. You know, we added a new grandchild this year. That's always wonderful, right? Uh, the bride stopped travel nursing, came home. That was big. We've had a record year at jeanspage.com. Absolutely tremendous year. We've had a great year on the Boneyard. Had a new book out this year. Uh, that, that's always fun, right? I already started working on the next one. Done a ton of research, learning so much. Uh, about Duty Noble. And, and uh, when I first got the idea, you know, I even called Sid Salter. One of the first phone calls I made was Sid Salter, you know, to kind of see what kind of access I'd have and things like that. And uh, I value Sid's opinion. You know, Sid's a guy that's been around a few 24 hours. And uh, Sid's like, yeah, I think it's a great idea. Steve's book should have been written 50 years ago. And he's right. And then I called Rick Cleveland, another guy who I value his opinion can't say I've always agreed with all of his sports takes, but, you know, when you get access to the governor of Mississippi sports writing, I said, hey, Rick, do you think this is a worthwhile pursuit? And he goes, I wish I'd have thought about it. You know, I'll I'll buy it immediately, you know. And so that kind of got me going. And the more research that I've done here in recent days, I've gone from thinking, hey, this will be a good book. Then thinking it'd be a great book. Now I think it may be the most meaningful sports book that I ever write. I mean, that's how important this thing is to me, and I'm approaching it with that in mind. I think it's a book, number one, that celebrates Mississippi State, but it also honors uh, the most decorated student athlete in the history of Mississippi State who went on to be a coach here in multiple sports and, of course, our athletic director uh, for a long, long time. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's exciting, but it gives me something to look forward to. I'm one of those kinds of people that um, I just can't live – an accidental life. I always have to have something that I'm working on and something to look forward to. Uh, I know many of you are kind of cut from the same cloth. And uh, the bride is like that too. Like she always likes to have a race, you know, that she's training for. It kind of gives her some purpose uh, in in addition to all the things that she does for for our family. But, uh, you know, as I shared with you guys before, I've, uh, I've, I've attended some planning classes. I went to the Franklin Covey planning class. It was phenomenal. I really changed my life in many respects. And then I had a great life coach named Brad Wordley who was, um, you know, said some things to me. I recently messaged Brad to let him know kind of how I'm doing these days. But uh, there are some people out there that have made a difference in my life. And uh, probably the greatest advice I can ever give you is to have personal goals for yourself outside of your career. You know, we, we get so career-minded You know, sometimes we forget that we're people, right? We always think about being professionals. I want to be successful professionally. 
But in order to truly be successful personally, and I think in life in general, you have to have some personal goals. You have to have some things uh, that make you different, that kind of drive you a little bit, motivate you uh, to use your skills and talents. And so I encourage you, if you're a person that um, has some ambition in life, but maybe perhaps not some direction, uh, to maybe use these next few days to find something and uh, make a commitment to yourself. And maybe make that commitment personally and say, hey, this is what I'm going to do this year. And then do it. It's that simple. You're like, well, Steve, I can't find the time. And there's always this. Yes, you can. You can find the time. So it doesn't matter to me if you're a painter or a writer or a musician. Uh, Maybe you're just really good with your hands. Maybe there's some things you've been putting off. Uh, Make some goals for yourself to give you a sense of accomplishment, maybe outside of parenting and professionalism. There's so much of that. We get so caught up paying the bills and raising kids, sometimes we forget that there are some things we want for ourselves. There's some things that we want to accomplish in life. And uh, I, I'm a firm believer. And when I, I'm the kind of person, once I make a commitment, like if I tell you all I'm going to do something, then I'm obligated to do it. And you find a way to get it done. And I can't count how many books that I started writing before I finally wrote one. You know, I always had that whole... Uh, you know, chronic fear of failure in many respects is like, well, you know, it gives me a sense of control to say, well, I'm just not going to do it. You know, they can't call you a failure when you never try. And so I encourage you to try. Uh, they hold the old uh, meme and adage out there about, you know, fear killed more dreams than failure ever could. Yeah, that's there's some truth in every bit of that. Hey, let's thank our friends at Bulldog Burger Company. I've got to get in this weekend. Might even go today. Probably go today or tomorrow. I love going in there because I know exactly what I'm going to get. And it doesn't matter what I choose on the menu. I know that I'm going to get quality service at a quality price and get spectacular food. We're going to have a great time when we go to Bulldog Burger Company. Three great locations to serve you. University Drive here in Star Vegas, Gloucester Street there in Tupelo, Lake Harbor Drive in the Ridge and Flowood area. Go by, have the spring rolls as your appetizer. They'll make you and everybody around you better looking. I would submit that's the best appetizer in Starkville proper. And I suspect that most people would probably agree with me. Uh, I think it's one of those things, when you find something in life that works with you, you kind of stick with it. I stick with the spring rolls more times than not. Have that great restaurant quality hamburger. And maybe you're not feeling like, hey, Steve, I don't want to eat quite so heavy. Cool. Have the BLT salad. It comes highly recommended from your good friend and host. I like it grilled. You may like it fried. But nevertheless, I think you're going to enjoy it. The portions there are so incredibly substantial. Bulldog Burger Company, the place where people go to meet, M-E-A-T. All right, in our first segment, we're going to break down our, our, our first three big moments uh, of the year. So, you, so essentially, you're getting two top tens today. You're going to get the top ten Mississippi State athletic moments as determined by me, and then my top ten rock songs of the year. How'd that be? All right, that'll be a fun list. And uh, we'll have a few honorable mentions, too. So our first segment of the show, we're going to talk about the, the top 10, 9, and 8, our first three moments of the year. Number 10 for me was the double overtime win by the Mississippi State Lady Basketball team to beat Tennessee. That was a very significant game. We, don't, we only hold a handful of wins over Tennessee in our history, right? That's important to understand. It's not one of those situations where it's like, well, you know, it's, you know, Tennessee wasn't great last year. Guys, people forget, you know, we lost that game in Knoxville 80-69 to 69, uh, to um, early in the, in, the, in, the, in the conference schedule. You beat Vanderbilt, you lose to Ole Miss, and we were swept by Ole Miss last year. First time that's happened in forever. And then we lose to Tennessee, and then, you know, give it a good go at, at Carolina. But, guys, we were 1-3 in, in the conference – Needed something to feel good about, and then suddenly this team kind of springs to life. Uh, we beat AM in College Station. You, you beat Auburn. You beat Kentucky by one big game there. Lose at Oxford by 15. That wasn't fun. And then, you know, probably the lowest point in the schedule, we, we get absolutely drilled at Georgia. And we thought, you know what, this team is just not going to work out this year. And just when it seemed that all was lost, we get a double overtime win against Tennessee. That's a game Sam Purcell got a technical foul late. It felt like the officials were trying to uh, to take the game from us. That's how it felt to me. Maybe you felt differently. 
But uh, the ladies, you know, get the big win there and then put together a three-game winning streak and really climb back into this thing. But uh, what's so significant about that game, number one, is, you know, Tennessee has had our number. You know, we didn't get our first win over uh, Tennessee and Knoxville until the Ben Schaefer era. It was rough, man. But what's crazy about this game is how nip and tuck it was the whole way through, right? They win the first quarter 15-13. We win 18-16 to tie the game there at the half. It's a 31-31 game. They get up by two in the third. We get up by two in the fourth to tie the game to force overtime. And then it's 10-10 in overtime number one. And then State puts it away late in this ball game. Huge win for us. And, uh, you know, the, the big moments late, Anastasia Hayes hits a big three to put us up three. And next thing you know, after an exchange of free throws, we're up six with 139 to go. And it felt like, hey, we're good. Give up a couple free throws there to make it a four-point game. Uh, they go one for two with under a minute to go to make it a three-point game. Another free throw with 26 seconds to go makes it a one-point game. And what do you know, Rakia Jackson fouls Romani Parker. We go to the line and we make them two to make it a four-point advantage. And uh, a couple free throws again late from Jillian Howings head uh, to make it a little tougher game. Uh, but lo and behold, what proved to be the winning point for us was Jerkelia Jordan, one of two from the line to make it a four-point game. And Rakia Jackson uh, hits a three-point shot late. Kind of a desperation deal there. And... Um, we win by one. Huge win, not just because of the fact we beat Tennessee, but with all that had gone on with all the drama with Rakia Jackson, um, you know, former Bulldog player that uh, came in, played exceptionally well. Maybe things didn't go as well as she hoped. She transfers, goes to Tennessee. So, a uh, big win for us. And, of course, um, you know, we got another big moment later for the ladies uh, here in this entire uh, top ten list. But, uh, for me, number ten – and to me, it's an easy call. You have to include that one. That was the win that kind of righted the ship for the Lady Bulldogs. All right, number nine on my list, and there's not a lot of uh, highlights, I guess, from football. But I, w- I would say the win over Arkansas, as bad as that game was, and it was certainly a challenge in many respects, we made it a lot harder than it had to be. But we win the ball game, and uh, what's significant about that too is nine of twelve. We beat Arkansas nine of twelve and five of the last seven. That's pretty impressive. And this is a team just about every year that's picked ahead of us. And I said on the show yesterday that the state will be picked seventh in the West. The only team that could probably compete with us for the seller next year is Arkansas, and that's in the preseason. And I think at the end of the year you're going to look at that and say, you know, hey. Mississippi State was a better team at Arkansas, and Arkansas comes to State to Starville next year, uh, so we got a good chance to win that ball game. The truth of the matter is, is that you, know, you one could make the argument, you know, dating back to the 2017 season, State probably shouldn't have lost any of these games to Arkansas. Remember, uh, you know, KJ Costello melted down against Barry Odom's drop eight, and then we missed three field goals in 2021 to lose by a field goal. It's really been about our own ineptitude. It hadn't been a situation where Arkansas has really done much against us. You, know, you go back to the 16 year when we had Sermonitis and Arkansas never had to punt. Uh, but, yeah, give them credit. They still had to go score the points. But uh, for the most part, since 2012, Mississippi State has had the better of things against Arkansas, including this year. One of the most anemic offenses that we have had in the modern era, and we go up there and win 7-3 with a great job by the Bulldog defense. Now, the only points scored on that day came following a Mike Wright pick. The Bulldog defense stands tall, forces a field goal. It's the only points that Arkansas scores on the day, and it really never felt like there was a real challenge. You know, outside of that little the, the, the scoop and score thing that got nullified because of a pre-snap penalty, Arkansas never really sniffed the Mississippi State goal line. And a great job by our defensive staff in that ball game. One of the few highlights that we could claim – uh, but, again, we can claim superiority over Arkansas even in a very mediocre year for Mississippi State. All right, number eight, and uh, this is one of the biggest wins in a long time on the men's side, and it's a, it came against Texas A&M. We didn't beat a ton of ranked teams last year on the men's side. Uh, I think sometimes that's 
maybe forgotten a little bit. And we went 21 and 13 overall and 8 and 10 in the conference. But you start running through here of the SEC schedule. We did have some big non conference wins that really helped us in the net. But, you know, you lose to number eight Alabama, then you lose to number eight Tennessee, uh, lose to 21 Auburn, number nine Tennessee, uh, a loss at number two Alabama by three, a great game for us. We just couldn't finish. Um, and then, you know, then you get into some of your contemporaries, and then late you get A&M. So the long SEC win over a ranked opponent came in Starkville on February 25th against Texas A&M, and there were so many people telling us this is not a great matchup for Mississippi State, and it's a game that we felt like we needed to win to help ourselves in the net, to keep us in the conversation to make the NCAA tournament. It was a huge, huge win for us, and people forget, you know, we had that loss to Kentucky, 71-68, and that really stung. You bounce back, you beat Ole Miss, and then you lose in overtime to Missouri. And that was one we could ill afford to lose. And it really felt like it was a very damaging game, which made that Texas A&M game essentially a must-win game. And lo and behold, what do we do? We find a way to go win that game. That's really when I think people feel like, you know what, hey, we're okay. And then we, we went out. That sparked a three-game winning streak to close out the regular season slate with wins over South Carolina and Vanderbilt. And then we go, oh, oh excuse me, we go one and two, one and one in the tournament. We beat Florida and lose to, uh, to Alabama. And Alabama got us pretty good. But that was a very significant win, not just because of the fact that A&M was so highly regarded in the net, even though they weren't ranked exceptionally high, but they were ranked, and that's our only – win against an SEC opponent that was currently ranked in the top 25 uh, at the time. So that's your number 10, number 9, number 8. We'll take a moment now. We'll do our top 10 rock songs of the year, and then we'll complete our list of top 10 Mississippi State athletic moments for 2023. Uh, the top 10 list always brought to you by CloseWithBlair.com. That's C-L-O-S-E with Blair, B-L-A-I-R.com. Give Blair a text or call today at 601-500-2344. Again, 601-500-2344. Uh, several of your compatriots, several of your fellow Boneyard listeners have given Blair a call and have left very satisfied with the service they've received. A top 1% close ratio in the country back-to-back-to-back to back to back years. He's recently made the move to Priority One Mortgage, but the level of service goes with him. Blair is a Bulldog, got season tickets in multiple sports, has a place here. I like to keep business in the family whenever I can. And this gives you the opportunity, number one, to entrust your mortgage in the hands of somebody that's been doing this at a very high level for a long time, but also to put some money in a Bulldog's pocket, right? You got to pay those fees anyway. They may as well go to somebody that's going to be making contributions to Mississippi State. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm a big, big, big proponent of that. Let's keep it in the family whenever we can. And Blair is a part of your family. He is. Now, he may be um, your crazy uncle, you know, maybe the one you, don't, you only talk about uh, at family reunions. But nevertheless, he is a part of your family. So visit CloseWithBlair.com today for all your mortgage needs. All right, my top 10 rock songs of the year. It wasn't hard to put the list together, but um, because you know, once we got in the top five, it all made perfect sense to me. But... Uh, a lot of new blood this year, and I didn't put a lot of new blood in the top 10 list, but I want to give a shout-out to some bands to watch in 2024. If you like this over-processed kind of you know, postmodern industrial sound that seems to be so in guard these days, or in vogue, pardon me, you're going to like the band Ghost Kid. I really like them. Uh, I think they're one of these bands, too, that... Um, there is a niche for them. It's a track called Heavy Rain, I think is a great introductory song. So again, if you like something that's a little bit heavier, it's a little more layered, it's got some keyboards in it, some computer activity and things like that, I think you're going to dig the band Ghost Kid. Uh, a newer band, and uh, these guys were actually kind of connected with uh, a band that's in our top 10 list, Fall in Reverse. It's a band called uh, Stray View. New track from them called What's Done is Done. Really like them. I think they're a band that's on the rise and probably a band for you to watch. And uh, a new band, that actually, I learned about them in uh, 2022. They've had a big 2023. It's a band called Catch My Breath. 
And um, there's a lot of different songs I could point you to here, a bunch for sure. Um, I, I would say, and Dial Tone is probably the introductory track for me, but I really like the track Shame On Me. Uh, it actually, the album was released last year, but uh, it was really, it hit the airwaves this year. They've got another one out now called 21 Gun Salute. It's decent. It's not as good to me uh, as the early ones, but uh, Catch My Breath, the band to really watch in 2024. All right, top 10. Number 10, and not just because it was a bulldog, but because of the fact, I like the fact that Hardy, you know, had the, the Mockingbird and the Crow album, had the countryside and then had the rock side. You know, if you know our friend Robbie Falk, Robbie was on the drum line uh, there at East Central Community College when Hardy was there. And uh, he said when, when Hardy went country, he goes, you know, he, this guy was always a rock guy. And so now we're beginning to see some of that rock side. I love this album from start to finish. Uh, it is absolutely phenomenal. And it was so crazy to me to hear Hardy played on Sirius XM Octane, which is my go-to station. Uh, when I do listen to Octane. The next thing you know, the song Jack is getting played everywhere. The writing is incredible. Uh, the band is incredible. Uh, there's bigger things to come from Hardy. Uh, he had a huge 2023. You know, what did he play, Talladega? You know, played the infield party at Talladega 500. I mean, there's just a lot, a lot of good things happening for Hardy. And uh, he's one of us. And so anytime we get the chance to promote our friend Hardy, Michael Hardy, um, you know, from Winston County, Mississippi. We want to do that. And so number 10 on my rock songs of the year is Hardy's Jack. I like Sold Out a lot too, but Jack, that's your number 10 song. Uh, number nine, a band that is tried and true, man, they've been around forever. It's so crazy to think about that, that uh, the, the P. Roach, man. The Papa Roach now is, uh, you know, kind of considered the OGs of the modern rock scene in many respects. Uh, Jerry Horton, a phenomenal guitar player, really a, very much a riff master. Uh, Jacoby Shaddix has changed a lot over the years. Uh, the, you know, what's interesting, too, is uh, one of the biggest songs of the year. We didn't include it on our list because it's a cover. But, um, you know, when Ronnie Radke of uh, Fault in Reverse slowed down and reimagined the classic song from Papa Roach, Last Resort, it immediately goes to number one, and it really changed the complexity of the song. You know, like we've sung that song for years and not really paid attention to the meaning. It was a very, it was basically a suicide note in many respects. Uh, but a little more positive music from Papa Roach these days. Uh, Jacoby's doing well. Uh, I understand that he's um, still working a program of recovery. But uh, wrote a great song this year called uh, Leave a Light On. I leave light on for you. It's a it's a great song. It's, it's kind of tuned down a little bit. Uh, not necessarily like all the yelling and screaming they did, you know, when many of you were kids. But uh, Papa Roach still doing it at an exceptionally high level and uh, selling out arenas all over the country. Number eight, one of my favorite bands of all time. One of my favorite bands of the modern era. They, uh, you know, they've had some big hits in recent years, but it's amazing the songs that as of late that have resonated with people are songs that have been written by Eric Bass, um, which is interesting to me. Uh, he was uh, kind of a an addition to the band. And so Planet Zero came out in 2022, but it had a big, 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 big 2023. I'm looking forward to new music for them. Uh, but one of the best songs on the radio this year uh, was from Shinedown. And it's a great song of a symptom of being human. I absolutely love the song. Uh, my first time through, when I first, you know, you know I, I'm like you guys. Like as soon as I get an album, I want to listen to everything. So I kind of sample it and I push through. That one kind of stuck to me. It did. Uh, it wasn't as good as Daylight to me, but it is a great song. And it's really one of those songs about, you know, we've all got problems, we've all got a struggle. You know, it's just a symptom of being human, you know. And uh, I think it's a very empowering song and uh, very positive. Uh, we all make some mistakes. But uh, that's number eight for me, Symptom of Being Human from Shinedown. Number seven, another guy working a program recovery these days. I've seen these guys live. I've seen most of these bands live. Uh, haven't seen Hardy live, but I think everybody else on the list, with rare exception, um, it's Beartooth. And uh, I love the new Beartooth material. And it's incredible to think about, 
you know, what has kind of happened with this band over the course of, uh, of their career. They, they came out, my first introduction to them was uh, in between. And as soon as I heard that, I said, these guys are a little bit different. That's off their disgusting album that dates back to 2014. So we've got about a decade of good music from these guys. Uh, but the album, The Surface, came out, and uh, so many great songs on this one. And matter of fact, Hardy even does uh, a collaboration with Beartooth on a track called uh, The Better Me, which is super, super cool. Um, but uh, the song we're going to go with number seven is uh, Might Love Myself. And uh, it's basically about, you know, you begin to kind of work through things, and you begin to work on yourself, and you begin to wor- learn that uh, the self-loathing doesn't get you anywhere. And um, that's a big part of this, man. There's so much of that. It's like there's so many self-fulfilling things in life, you know. And really, you begin to mirror what you feel in life. And uh, Caleb Shomo is uh, the the driving force behind Beartooth. Um, He stopped drinking, got in the gym, lost a bunch of weight, got a newfound sense of confidence. And the music has been so much more positive. And uh, again, it kind of mirrors the soul, right? Uh, So we're going to go with number seven, Beartooth's Might Love Myself. Number six, friends, the holiday season is here. You're going to be on the go. You got to get out. You got to shop. You got to go all these different events and parties. And sometimes you don't make time for yourself to ensure that you're getting a nutritious and flavorful meal. Let me recommend our friends at Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal delivery service. They can help you eat well for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian approved ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, effort, and even maintain your healthy lifestyle. In the middle of all that, you're going to be on the go, and you may not be eating as well as you should. So allow the folks at Factor to help you kind of cross meal prepping off your list this holiday season. Skip all the planning, the shopping, the shopping, the prepping, cleaning up. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals delivered to your door, ready in just two minutes, and they're absolutely delicious. Uh, I've partaken of these wonderful meals. Uh, It's a great lunch portion, too. So like if you're on the go at work, you think, you know, I'm not going to have time to get out and go get lunch today. Uh, The Factor meal portion Absolutely outstanding. So head to factormeals.com slash boneyard50. That's a number 50. Use promo code boneyard50 and get 50% off. It's my gift to you this holiday season. That's code boneyard50 at factormeals.com slash boneyard50. And be sure and get that 50% off. And uh, I, I love this band I have for a long time. It's from Ashes to New. Uh, they are one of those kind of postmodern bands where they kind of work in a little bit of rap, uh, but it's still got a heavier edge to it. Uh, we've done an Ashes to New Top 10 list. Uh, their big hit this year, and I always joke with the wife when she turns the, this comes on and she'll crank the radio. And I say, you trying to tell me something? You know, uh, but it's uh, Hate Me Too. And basically it's about a couple that, um, you know, so I wish I hated you. Because after all the things that we've been through, you should probably hate me too, you know. Um, that's not how we feel about each other. At least I hope, right? But it, I joke with her about that. But uh, it's a great Ashes to New song. And if you were a, maybe somebody looking for a newer band, any of those guys have been out for a while now, let me introduce you to for the From Ashes to New catalog. It's worth your time and effort to listen to that. All right, number five, we talked about it this year. One of the things I did in 2023 is I got a Ronnie Radke tattoo. Ronnie Radke is kind of a controversial figure in music because Ronnie Radke simply doesn't care. He just doesn't care. He doesn't care what people think about him. Um, what's interesting, I remember that he was shamed by so many people in the media uh, over some allegations of criminal activity, and he was later exonerated and uh, actually filed a lawsuit that was settled in, in his favor. And it's funny that that stuff didn't make the papers. It's only the negative stuff. People, you know, these clickbait bandits, they want to write these sensationalized headlines. You know, so-and-so accused of this. You know, it's just an accusation. But when there is actually a legal process and that person is exonerated, they don't have as much to say. It's funny how life works like that. Uh, Ronnie Radke is a Creek Indian. He's a guy that's run into some trouble in his life. Um, Went to jail. uh, Was part of um, Escape to Fate for a while and then left them and uh, began the great group Falling in Reverse. And for the last two years, uh, Falling in Reverse has had some huge, huge hits. 
Uh, so we're going to pick um, Watch the World Burn for our number five song from Falling in Reverse. And uh, again, I'm a big Ronnie Radke guy. I like people that are a little bit misunderstood and then kind of live life with their middle finger in the air. It's like, I'm going to be me. And if you don't like it, that's a you problem, not a me problem. And um, that's really who Ronnie Radke is. Not to say that I agree with everything that he does or everything that he believes or everything that he says, but I can get behind that level of attitude of like, hey, I'm going to be an individual and I'm going to be me. I'm not going to conform to what you think I should be. Uh, so I get it. So fall in reverse, watch the world burn, number five. Number four, we've talked about this band a lot this year. And uh, I remember the very first time that I heard uh, their first single, I thought they were an unsigned band out of Memphis, Tennessee. We're talking sleep theory. And I've had so many people that have messaged me, people from Memphis. It was like, Steve, thanks for giving this band a shout out. We've loved these guys for a while. I have other people that have said, Steve, I've never heard this band before, but I love everything on this debut EP. And I think you will too. I absolutely love it, man. Um, this song actually charted really well. It was number one for several weeks on the Biggins Countdown on Sirius XM Octane. It's numb from Sleep Theory. And for those of you that have followed the show for a while, you'll know that uh, the book When the Bottom Falls, the title uh, is you know kind of inspired by the, the, their track Another Way. Um, and so I think it's important that we, number one, support new music. I'm a firm believer that uh, when you stop getting new music is when you start dying. That's just kind of how I feel about it. Maybe you feel differently, but that's how I feel. But Sleep Theory's numb, number four. Number three, we discussed this a little bit yesterday on our Mike Shinoda list. And uh, the release this year of Lost from Linkin Park, that's your number three song. Of course, it was a bonus track previously unreleased when uh, Linkin Park released Meteora because they felt it was just kind of too similar to, uh, I think, Crawling was the one that they went with that Lost and Crawling were too similar. And, uh, of course, they released this new music, and uh, it was number one. It immediately went to number one, as it should. Linkin Park, a legendary band for this generation, and uh, we've lost Chester far too soon. And it's so good to be able to hear something really new for, to us, even though it was kind of tucked away you know, on a computer somewhere, uh, you know, that, hey, this is a song that we can share with the people. And uh, we hope that there's a few more tucked away out there that we get to hear. But um, great track and uh, so happy for the longtime Linkin Park fans. Of uh, the bands on this list, this is one of the few that I haven't seen. But uh, I'll never get to now. And uh, that's the thing. I always encourage people to go out and see your favorite artists play live because you never know when they're going to stop touring or something's going to happen that prevents you from seeing them. But, uh, again, we celebrate Linkin Park. We celebrate, uh, you know, the joy of music with our number three song, Linkin Park's Lost. Number two, I actually have lyrics for this song tattooed on my chest. Not that you need to know that, but just to show you how important it is. When I was out in New Mexico uh, late last year, uh, there used to be a band called Slaves, and uh, they elected to change their name to Rain City Drive, uh, the band Slaves was about addiction. You know, most of their songs, you know, were about recovery. They were people that had gone, got into recovery, formed a band, and uh, ended up firing the lead singer. He had some other issues. So when they fired the, the lead singer, they ultimately elected to change their name to Rain City Drive. Uh, really dig these guys a lot. They've got a hit out now. Uh, I, I encourage you, you know, to check these guys out. I, I love them. they got a huge vocal. And it's not one of these computerized vocals. Like there's some people out there like me or you, we go get in the studio and they've got to really work hard to make us sound marketable. Not, not these guys. Rain City Drive is remarkable. And so when I was out there, Dana was already listening to the brand new Rain City Drive album. And this song hadn't been released yet. The single that was out at the time was a song called Frozen. And uh, there's a song called Blood Runs Cold. And um, Dana absolutely loved it. She said, every time I hear this song, I think about us. And uh, not every lyric is applicable to us, but um, I loved it so much. And she's not the real sentimental type. I'm the romantic in the family, you know, and I guess it takes us both. But, um, you know, I like doing special things for her. She likes receiving those things. She does a lot of things for me, too. I'm not trying to sit here and say it's all one sided, but she's not the kind of person to kind of let her guard down and say, hey, this means something to me. And so when she did, I went out and got it tattooed. Uh, some lyrics in the song and um, 
I've done that twice now. I remember one time we were out shooting pool and the song Gravity from P. Roach was out. And uh, she told me, she said, you're my gravity. When I get ready to float away, you hold me down. And uh, you keep me grounded. So I went out the very next day and I got gravity tattooed on my wrist. And she has it on her ankle. So it's kind of like if the gravity's ever met. It, it's kind of, you, you get the picture, right? Uh, but yeah, it was an important song to her. It's so funny too. I was actually in a tattoo chair and she faced, she called me. She goes, I hear you're brushing your teeth or you're shaving. I'm like, well, not exactly. So I went switched over to FaceTime and she saw it immediately. I'll never forget the look on her face, you know, because it meant something to her. It did. Uh, number one, I saw this band at the Signal in Chattanooga as part of Dana and I's 30-year uh, anniversary trip back in May. And I told you guys then, when I got back on the show, there is something very special happening in music with this band. They have found the currency and people have responded. They sell out every show. You can't get merch. I've got an album of vinyl that I ordered months ago that still hadn't made it because they can't keep up with demand, which is amazing to me. But it's the band Bad Omens, and they released this late 2022, but this year has been the year of Bad Omens in modern rock music. And we're gonna go with the title track, The Death of Peace of Mind. And uh, it's the answer to that question, you know, it's like when you begin to think you, what you're thinking is, what does that mean, the death of peace of mind? It's love. As great as love is, you know how it is. Like, it's, that's why it's so relatable. It's like you go through and you just kind of, everything is good in life, and all of a sudden you meet somebody. And all of a sudden you open yourself up to them. And it's like, you know, you hope they love you back, and you hope that they're doing the things that they're telling you're going to do, and you can trust them, and they're out there. Uh, protecting your heart while they hold it because you're putting everything into them and in many respects love becomes a death to peace of mind because now all of a sudden you've got new problems to worry about now there's nothing better than being in love it's not an anti-love song but it's important to understand there is a certain level of anxiety that goes along with that it's true uh, I love this album from start to finish what's interesting is probably my least favorite song on the album is currently on the radio nowhere to go uh, but I absolutely love this album. Uh, I think t if I ever do anything um, musically again, which I, I'm actually working on a couple things now, but uh, I would want it to sound a lot like Bad Omens. It just kind of scratches you where you itch. I really like the song Take Me First, which is probably the one song that is uh, more of a traditional rock song in many respects. But um, there's another track called uh, I Don't Want the Money. And it's initialized out, and it is an absolute banger. I absolutely love that song from start to finish. Uh, they use the falsetto, and there's the screaming, the yelling, there's, there's everything. It's a cornucopia of sounds, shall we say. But uh, to me, there's no band that had a bigger 2023 than Bad Omens. And uh, going to see them live really drove it home to me. Like, as soon as they open the doors, like, people run to the merch booth because they know they're going to sell out of stuff. And so then you go into the venue, and it's packed out. I mean, it's like nowhere to stand. It was like in those days, in the early days of Guns N' Roses. I mean, I'm not comparing them to guns, but just the response that they've gotten from other people uh, from the record-buying public has been phenomenal. And you can dial them up, and you can look, and there's all these super fans and people going out getting Bad Omens tattoos. I got Dana's shirt. And uh, it's just one of those things you, you begin to think, you know, we're waiting for the next new wave. And I firmly believe it's bad omens. So I hope you enjoy the list and I hope you enjoy some rock. And I hope you enjoy some music this weekend, New Year's Eve weekend. If you have ideas for the top 10 list, reach out, let us know. Best way to do that is to hit up Roy at uh, Dogmatic67 on Twitter. That's D-A-W-G-M-A-T-I-C-6-7. He's also on Spotify under the same handle where our great lists are housed. And I want to thank Roy for doing that. It was his idea. He contacted me years ago, and I'm like, I don't know if I want to do this. He goes, no, I'll do it for you. I'm like, okay, cool, great. And he goes, I'll just do it for free because I love the show. I love a top ten list. And uh, which reminds me, I've got to send him a copy of this so he can get that up for you. Uh, but anyway, we love doing the list. We have so much feedback on it, good and bad. And that's Okay. You know, we're never all going to agree. The chances of all of us getting together and uh, having a drink or breaking bread together and getting along by the end of the night, probably not very good because you never know where the topic's going to lead. Uh, and it comes to music, a lot of people, they, you know, 
that just love their brand of music. And uh, you can't talk them out of it, and that's okay. So we do vary it up every now and again. But uh, again, wanted to celebrate uh, rock music of 2023. I'm not just an 80s hair band guy, contrary to popular belief. Uh, so I encourage you, get out and expand your horizons a little bit. You can enjoy the classics and enjoy some new stuff too. All right, next segment of the show brought to you by Campus Book Mart, a Starkvillian institution. Campus Book Mart, the best selection of Mississippi State merchandise in the known universe. Be sure and stop by and see their smiling faces next time you're in town. You'll be glad you did. You can outfit your family, your home, your RV, your pet, your office, anything that you have with Mississippi State merchandise right here at a Starkville business, Campus Book Mart. I encourage you to support Starkville business leaders, even if you live out of state. You love Starkville. Let's make Starkville a better place. So you can shop online at campusbookmart.net and get your Mississippi State merchandise just steps away from the Mississippi State campus. Visit them at campusbookmart.net. Use promo code BSR, which stands for Beautiful Steve Robertson. That gets you free shipping on all orders over 75 bucks. Any order less than 75 bones, absolutely incomplete. Again, that's Campus Book Mart. So let's resume our countdown of the top 10 moments in Mississippi State Athletics uh, for the 2023 season. Uh, number seven on our list, and uh, it should come as no surprise. Some would say, with Steve, it's a little bit lower than I would have it, and that's okay. But it's Mississippi State's series win over Ole Miss. And I know that's kind of become my old hat around these parts. You know, we, we expect to win that series, even in the worst of times, and we did this year. To kind of frame that up for you a little bit, you know, State goes 3-1 and one, uh, against Ole Miss. We lose game one of Super Bulldog weekend, Three to two. We battle back and win eight to seven on Saturday. You know, that's that very, very, very memorable weekend when uh, Dakota Jordan uh, came through late, you know, with the big hit there in the ninth. Guys, we, you know, we were down in this ball game seven to six and rallied back to win in the ninth inning. You may have forgotten that. It was a very, very, very dramatic situation. Amani Larry opens that inning with a walk. They make a pitching change. Um, Rashawn gets a sack bunt down to push the tying run to second. Then they walk Colton Ledbetter. Great A.B. here. Colton gets down to 0-2 in the count and ultimately walks. And you don't want to make a mistake to Colton Ledbetter, right? The next thing you know, it's a wild pitch, and both runners move up 90 feet. They're now in scoring position, and they walk Hunter Hines to set up the double play. Uh, it, was, it was one of those kind of – unintentional, intentional walks, but to set up a force here, they actually got into a 2-2 count, but uh, Hunter wins the A-B, and Dakota Jordan gets ahead 2-0 in the count. You're thinking, okay, at the very least, he'll be able to elevate something and we can tie the game, but instead, he singles through the left side, two-run score, and State walks off winners. We come back on Sunday uh, needing to win a game here. Uh, to win the series. And uh, you certainly expected that to be the case. You know, Bulldogs played at home and the fact that we just simply had their number. State gets out to a 3 nothing lead in the third inning. Ole Miss gets one in the sixth to make it a 3-1 game. They tie the game in the seventh, 3-3. Three to three. And then State answers right back like good teams do, even though we weren't a great team. State's able to get those two runs back there in the seventh. Uh, again, and, and you start thinking about you know, who's involved here, right? We get a ground out, and then Mershon walks. Great A-B for him. They make a pitching change. Mershon takes second. So now the go-ahead run is in the scoring position. Ledbetter strikes out swinging. And then Hunter Hines with a moonshot on the very first pitch to right field put State up 5-3, to three, and it became a lead that State would never relinquish. Uh, we worked through this thing, you know, and pitching was a real challenge for us. But – Casey Hunt comes in, and uh, we finish up there with uh, Aaron Nixon. Aaron Nixon, phenomenal down the stretch. Uh, he goes uh, two and two-thirds, but then he allows just one hit, the only, uh, the only base runner in his 30 pitches. Uh, great job by Aaron Nixon. So State takes that series, and at the time, you know, that seemed very significant. We began to think, okay, we got off to a slow start. We've kind of readied the ship a little bit here, righted the ship, shall we say. We should have won that series against South Carolina. Uh, but you take two out of three from Alabama again, and then you take two out of three from Ole Miss, and you think, hey, we can go to Auburn and take two out of three there. We're right back in the thick of things. And, of course, we blow the big lead on Sunday. Blew, nearly blew it on Saturday. But uh, we lose the series, 
And uh, from that point forward, Mississippi State was really kind of out of the mix for Hoover. We were still kind of battling and hoping some things would go our way, uh, but it didn't go the way we had hoped. We went down to the last game of the weekend on the final weekend uh, to try to get to Hoover and just couldn't get it done. All right, number six on your list of top moments is actually a twosome. It's the Mississippi State men's basketball sweeping Ole Miss. We take uh, both games, and uh, they were both significant, of course. Ole Miss didn't have a great year last year, but, of course, the rivalry is always important to win. And more times than not, we split those games. But we won them both. 64-54 winners in Starkville on January the 7th. And then we bounced back and uh, win in overtime February the 18th in Oxford. Uh, big, big game. Of course, uh, yeah, Chris Jans always kind of keeps us in games. That's the thing. Again, you go back and look. There are only two games last year that got out of hand, and that's that, uh, you know, that game at Tennessee and then losing to Alabama in the SEC tournament. Uh, but it was very significant, and this is not our final men's basketball moment, but uh, to take both from Ole Miss, a very, very pedestrian Ole Miss team, uh, was important for our team not just because of the fact we needed those two SEC wins, but, uh, you know, you want to be able to have some in-state supremacy, and we're able to do that. So that's your number six moment, the sweep of Ole Miss in men's basketball. All right, number five, and again, not a lot of football stuff that we can be proud of, but uh, the win over Arizona, even more significant now in hindsight, right? Right. Uh, not to mention the fact that we won that game in overtime, but also the first time in school history since they started the Power Five mandate that Mississippi State's able to sweep a two-game series. We win last year in Tucson and then bounce back this year and uh, win this game. And let's be honest about this game. Arizona really was fortunate to be in the game late. It was some of State's own ineptitude that kind of allowed them to hang around a bit. But uh, you go back and look now – in hindsight, we now have the gift of that. They win the Alamo Bowl uh, last night to beat Oklahoma 38-24. to Very significant win for Jed Fish and his staff out there. And uh, there were a lot of people that thought that uh, Fish might be on the move this year. Uh, that doesn't appear to be the case. You know, now the dust has all really began to settle. But uh, the Arizona defense, uh, kind of reminiscent of the old desert swarm days, forced six turnovers last night. A uh, pretty significant win for Arizona. And you go back and you begin to think, okay, the complexity of all this thing. Arizona finishes the year with 10 wins and just three losses. And one of those three losses came against Mississippi State. And that was the thing, too. We win that game and we thought, okay, we're going to be okay. And I'll be honest with you. I didn't think Arizona would be a bowl team this year. I thought they were going to struggle to get there. But, of course, they make the quarterback change, Jaden DeLara, a uh, phenomenal player there, but uh, had some injuries, and they end up uh, having to make a quarterback change. It really sparked some things down the stretch for them. And uh, you say, well, you know, Steve, we didn't beat the same team. And, uh, you know, it's true, but the reality of it is, is you look at this deal and you begin to realize this was a quality win. We didn't have many, but this is one you look at. Again, 10-3, to 3, and they, they closed the year out on a seven-game winning streak. What's interesting, too, they lose to Washington. That's one of their three losses, and they lose to number nine, USC. Those are the three. Two of those three come on the road, and all of them are within a score. So great year for the Wildcats, and I'm sure they're looking back in hindsight saying, how in the world did we lose that game? Well, if you recall, this is a ball game that, you know, State let them kind of hang around but give them credit for making the plays they did. State jumps out to a 14-0 lead. And then we give up a ridiculous touchdown just before the half. State should have been up two scores. Uh, third quarter ends with State up 21-14. to 14. Arizona battles back there. Uh, they do. And, uh, you know, made this thing awfully interesting. Uh, scored 10 points in the fourth quarter. We just get the field goal there. And uh, we're fortunate to get it to force overtime. And then you get into the overtime period. And uh, the Mississippi State defense just said, no, we're not going to do it. But uh, Will Rogers runs for seven yards, and then they call it back, and so that's first and 20 from the 35. And you're thinking, we're fixing to lose this game. That's how I felt. We get it out to Woody for six, and on second and 14, they run that great little throwback screen to Jeffrey Pittman, 
who blitzes 19, 29 yards into the end zone, dives in. Field goal is good. Extra point's good. And then Jaden Delara, we, we get them in a terrible situation here, right? It's incomplete, incomplete, incomplete. Now it's fourth and ten. And Delora, I think, ran about 75 yards on this play. He dives for the marker. They review it. He's short. The review holds up. And, uh, you know, initially they said he had the first down. And then after that, we saw the end stadium replay. We're thinking, hey, it looks like his elbow is down just short of the line of the game. Turns out that he was. And then Zach Arnett drops uh, an F-bomb on live TV talking to Cole Kublik. But uh, big win for Mississippi State. We didn't realize at the time how big it was going to be. But now that the season is, is completed, we look at it and say, you know what? That was a quality win. And it absolutely was a quality win. All right, number four. Another women's basketball moment for us. As uh, the ladies, you know, they win the play-in game. And then, lo and behold, what do we do? We find a way to beat Creighton. Very significant win. And, and again, you, you, you dial it up yourself and you begin to work through this thing. Uh, you know, we needed some big wins down the stretch to, uh, to even get on the bubble there. And we nearly cost ourselves with uh, that loss to Texas A&M, 13 seed A&M. And, yes, they'd gotten healthy. And, yes, they made a good run late. But it's a game we feel like we should have won. So in the play-in game, we take down Illinois 70-56. to 56. All right, so then all of a sudden that makes us the 11th seed. We've got to play Creighton. I don't think many people outside of the Mississippi State fan base felt like we had a chance to win this game. Not only did we win it, we absolutely drilled them 81-66. to 66. And, of course, that game was played at Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana. And then we get Notre Dame, the three seed, that Sunday in the Sweet 16 game and nearly won that one. Pretty incredible performance. And, again, it shows, I think, how good a job Sam Purcell did coaching. You dropped that game by five. But, man, how, what a great fourth quarter that was. We had so many opportunities to just kind of narrow the gap there, and we just couldn't quite get it finished. But um, it really, I think, validated the hire of Sam Purcell. I'm sitting here looking at the notes here now. Guys, it was a 41-41 game with 6.50 to play. Uh, pretty significant there. And then, you know, the final few minutes there, you know, we, we get it to a one-point game and then tie it with four minutes to play. And you think, hey, we're going to find a way to get this thing done. And down the stretch, we just couldn't make a basket. It's as simple as that. We just couldn't, you know, we're down six with under 30 seconds to play. And uh, But, yeah, what a, what a good first year for Sam Purcell. And, uh, again, I, I think it's pretty fair to say – that we have made the right hire. Sam Purcell is recruiting at a very high level. We're finally getting healthy. We're playing well now. Uh, but uh, for year one, the fact that we got to hang a Sweet 16 banner for the first time in a couple of years, uh, pretty significant. First time since Vic Schaefer left us for Texas. And I think a lot of people look and say, you know what? Hey, it's fun again. We can get excited about this uh, again. So that's your number four moment of the 2023 year is Mississippi State winning against Creighton in the NCAA tournament. Uh, Very, very, very significant win against a team that most people didn't give us a chance against. And uh, so, you know, two big wins uh, on our list from uh, the women's basketball side. All right, number three on our list. And this is, again, one that I think most people uh, didn't expect. I think a lot of people almost kind of rooting against us here. Let's just kind of, you know, call it for what it is. I think some people felt that way. They're ready for the Chris Lamonis era to come to an end. We talked about that Ole Miss series and then the Auburn series. We lose that when we bounce back to beat Ole Miss in the uh, Governor's game 2-1. And then we get absolutely embarrassed by, by uh, Tennessee. You know, we should have won the Thursday game. I was there. We lose 8-7. to Just couldn't close it out. And then Tennessee gets us 12-8 to and 13-2. to and I can promise you that Saturday I was ready to get going. Uh, the wife actually got on a plane to go to San Diego uh, for the True Rest, Conven- uh, True Rest uh, University. And we'll be bringing that. We just joined the Starkville, the Greater Starkville Partnership, too. Because uh, we're not just committed to Mississippi State. We're committed to making Starkville a better place. After that debacle against uh, Tennessee, we, we lose three, get swept again by Arkansas. And I, I get sick and tired of that. I'm not going to lie to you. I get sick and tired of us not being able to take Arkansas. They're, they're kind of our contemporaries right now. That's become a real rivalry. 
And then we head down to LSU. Now, LSU has been our true baseball rival much of my life. You know, of course, we talk about the Ole Miss thing, and anytime it's an in-state rival, you want to beat them. It doesn't matter the sports. I mean, I've told people before on radio shows, you could get a kid in a maroon shirt and a kid in a powder blue shirt and let them play Chinese checkers. You could sell tickets. But LSU has always been the measuring stick for our program. When we beat them, we generally did pretty well. And we headed down there knowing Paul Skeens is going to be on the mound on Friday. I actually missed that game because my daughter graduated. Got up the next day and drove down, and the Bulldogs went on Saturday 9-4 to to even the series. And then we had this wild game on Sunday, on May 14th. That was anniversary eve for me. But May 14th, and a wild game in so many aspects. This is a ball game that, uh, you know, both teams' issues in the bullpen were evident. Pretty crazy. So LSU gets up 3 nothing in the second. We score one in the third. They answer right back. It's a 5-1 ball game. Then we, we battle back and put up three in the fourth. And now you think, okay, it's a 5-4 game. State's in it. Well, no. LSU put on five. You think, well, you know, this game's going to be over. You know, it's 10-4 midway through. And just for good measure, LSU adds three more in the fifth. You think, well, this is it, 13-4. They're going to 10-run rural state, get on out of here, and just kind of breeze their way into Omaha. Well, no. State puts up six, excuse me, four runs in the sixth and then five in the seventh to tie the game. We had our chances in the eighth and ninth to take the lead, and lo and behold, State does it in the tenth. And if you recall, that game ended on a pretty wild double play. You know, fly ball to center field, and we're able to double the runner off first. State with 16 hits in the game, LSU with 13. Uh, Aaron Nixon credited with the win, his second of the, se- the season. Riley Cooper drops to three and three. Uh, pretty significant offensive day. And, again, that's what happens on Sundays. It turns into a church league softball game when you don't have any pitching. Uh, and if LSU did, did go on to win the NAFL championship. That's one of the things you look at. You know, I, I remember talking to Chris Simonis. As a coach, there's no way that I throw Cade Smith against Skeens. Nothing against Cade, but I wouldn't waste him against Skeens. He just kind of laughed. What's well, lo and behold, that's what we did. We threw off against Skeens. And some people panned the decision. But ultimately, those people look kind of silly in the end. Because it's not about just winning a game. It's about winning the weekend. And Chris Simonis obviously uh, needed some things to go right for Mississippi State. Uh, that kept us alive and a chance to go to Hoover to make the SEC tournament. You know, we, we didn't think there was really anything beyond that, but we thought, hey, let's at least get back to Hoover, be a step back in the right direction. Uh, you have the big walk-off against Texas A&M, and Larry, you know, hits the big uh, you know, home run there to walk us off and send us home, as Bart Gregory said. And so you win that game, you're thinking, okay, we just need to find a way to win one more. You got two games to do it. We dropped a Saturday game 6-4. to four. And it's one of those ones you look at it's kind of in hindsight and you just begin to think to yourself, why did we keep pitching to Laviolette? He hits a home run in the first to make it 2 nothing. We battle back, tie it up. He comes up in the third. He hits another home run to make it 3-2. We tie it at three. And then Highfill in the eighth, singles through the right side, a run is ahead. Now it's a 4-3 ball game, and you just got to go close this thing out. And what do we do? We get in some bad situation here, and we give up a three-run home run to Laviolette. And people are like, well, you know, no. no, You, you don't keep pitching to that guy. You, you just don't. Uh, there was uh, Here's how that inning went. Haas flew out to center, so it's one down. You get up a single. There's a pass ball to move the guy. Uh, to second base, and there's another single, and then, but, you know, here we are. You got a base open, and you got a guy that's absolutely locked in, and we give up the home run. Well, the next guy, Thompson, flies out to right, and then Targak strikes out swinging. You know, hindsight is a beautiful thing, but I've been around baseball enough to know, even in that situation, I'm not pitching to that dude. I'll load the bases, um, you know, set up a force at every base. I'm not going to let that kid beat me, and he did. 
and he is going to be absolute uncharted hell in the SEC this year. And uh, the fact that they got Braden Montgomery up there too, it's going to be more difficult in the middle of that order. Uh, but uh, that's how the season ended for us. But, of course, uh, you know, we can say, hey, we took two out of three from LSU. But to be fair with you about that, I have uh, greater aspirations for Mississippi State baseball than that. It's like, well, hey, LSU won the NFL championship, and we took two out of three from them. Uh, like, I, I want to be able to compete with LSU, not just on a weekend, but annually. I want to be in contention for big things and beat LSU when it matters most. And, yeah. It's, it was a great series win for us, but it, we were we didn't make Hoover. And so, yeah, we, we can look back and say we, we extended the winning streak against Ole Miss and took three games out of four against them, and we took two out of three from LSU. But that's a, a very, 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 very small victory in the grand scheme. And uh, we know what to expect this year. You know, we know that we've got to go out and win and win big. All right, number two, maybe a surprise for many. It shouldn't be. We had history this year made on the soccer pitch. We absolutely did. Uh, James Armstrong and the ladies, just a tremendous job this year. And uh, one of the biggest wins in school history is Mississippi State takes down Brown out in Palo Alto to advance to the Sweet 16. And nearly, nearly able to pull it off against Stanford, uh, which would have been significant because we would have hosted next, Right. We lose that ball game one to nothing. I watched every minute of it. And um, Stanford, the number two seed. We guys, we have we have done such a good job on the soccer pitch, and I don't think a lot of people realize that. Uh, I get very excited when we win, and I don't always have time to go. When the games are on TV, I always try to find time to watch them. Uh, but this was a very very special year for us. And I'm so incredibly proud of all of the students and the locals and people that turn out to give us such a great home pitch environment. You, you, you folks are to be commended. And uh, our ladies, of course, uh, Coach Armstrong doing just an amazing job. And there's just so many things you work through on this, on this schedule. There's so many things we could feel good about. We were a really good team this year. We went 12-6-5. And, and there are a couple of games out there that we probably should have won that ended up being draws. But the reality of it is, is we are a program on the move and on the rise. And they are worthy of your support. If you get a chance to go, I'm going to encourage you to turn out and go be a part of all of that because you're going to see something very exciting. And I think we are recruiting a brand of athlete that maybe we haven't in years past. So it's a big deal in every respect. So the number two moment in Mississippi State – sports this year the women's soccer win in an NCAA tournament uh, to advance to the Sweet 16. Number one and it's uh, interesting you know th- there were so many people that told me you know hey you know Steve we don't need to make a coaching change in football this year we've got all these other things going on and ultimately we did and we hired Jeff Levy and that's your number one sports moment of the year and you said but Steve it's just a hire But here's the thing. We have to take care of football first because football takes care of everything. And I had somebody on campus tell me that whenever the decision was made uh, to move on from Zach Garnett. We wish Zach the absolute best. I understand that uh, Georgia Tech has had some interest in him possibly being a D.C. Don't know how true that is. I haven't spoken to Zach since the postgame press conference against Texas A&M. I did text him. Uh, the day that he was fired, and thanked him for his contributions to Mississippi State, wished him and his family well. Uh, That's the last interaction I've had with him. Um, But we had to make a change. And, uh, again, I I am very grateful to Zach Arnett for stepping up in our time of need. Uh, But it is time for us to move on from that. Yeah, that's one of the things I thought about with this year in review. You know, it's a new era with a new staff with no real connections Uh, you know, to the leech air raid from a real personal point of view. Philosophically, there are some things that are very similar. But um, in my mind, that chapter for us is closed. I'm not saying that we should ever, uh, you know, look at all that as an excuse, right? The reality of it is those things happened, and there was a ripple effect that, uh, that really damaged us. It did. But all hope springs eternal with a new coach. Uh, I have said many times that I think we have to hire an offensive-minded coach. I was told multiple times through the process we'd like to hire a sitting coach who could bring a staff 
uh, in kind of intact. That isn't what happened. But I think Jeff Labby, number one, when you see what's happened, you know, and I, I don't want to kind of get caught up in the whole uh, Arnett effect of all of that, you know, because Zach made a lot of good decisions off the field uh, prior to us playing football games. And I, one of the things I'll tell you, too, I remember I, th- I said on the show, I thought we had a chance to have a special year. Uh, thought we had a possibility to win as many as 10 games. You know, I picked us at 8-4, and four, but, you know, there, there's some games out there, some, some coin toss games that I felt like, hey, with the, the right momentum and confidence, we got a chance to have a special year. We didn't. I remember seeing Zach and somebody had mentioned to him about the show that uh, I said that 8-4 and four was the floor. And he's like, oh, no, 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 lower the expectations, lower the expectations. He said, we want to, you know, under-promise and over-deliver. And uh, we didn't. Uh, so, you know, we had some injuries, and uh, there's some things that have happened, obviously, kind of beyond Zach Arnett's control. And I think Zach Arnett eventually will be a head coach again. And uh, I think we'll do a good job. But uh, the Arnett chapter is now closed. It is now the Jeff Levy era here at Mississippi State. As I mentioned on yesterday's show, we need to be patient. You know, we don't need to be out there in week two next year, uh, you know, calling, oh, we made a mistake, and it's going to happen, you know, because people are prisoners of the moment. Uh, and I think the thing with Jeff Levy is we've got to give him time to work, give him some time to get his guys. Uh, I think with his brand of offense, he is going to open up some doors for us from an offensive recruiting standpoint that maybe have been closed over the course of the last – year or so you know Mike Leach was able to go out and get highly recruited quarterbacks I think Jeff Levy will do exactly the same thing but I think Jeff Levy's scheme is also going to have a a much bigger running component Uh, running backs are going to be different you know you're not going to be able to go out there and get the guys that um, you're not going to get the Mike Rogiers of the day you know you're not going to get a Bo Jackson or Herschel Walker but you just got to go get a serviceable back you got to go get some people that obviously can can handle both facets of the offense not to mention be good uh, you know, pass protectors when called upon um, in third down situations. But uh, I'm excited about the Levy era. I think you all should be too. And I think when you look at what we're doing right now recruiting-wise, and it's like everybody – the first thing everybody wants to do is compare what State's doing to Ole Miss. Now, Ole Miss is killing us in the portal. Let's just kind of call that for what it is. And if you look at it from a player's point of view – If you're not from Mississippi and you don't have ties to Mississippi State or Ole Miss, and uh, you you look at it and say, hey, you know, Ole Miss is only two losses this year with Alabama and Georgia, the defending NFL champions and a team that made the playoff. They're primed and ready to go for next year. And you look at Mississippi State and say, hey, Mississippi State went five and seven. They made a coaching change. Uh, It's a rebuild type deal. I got one year of eligibility left. Where would I rather go play? Well, I think it's an easy decision. I think you'd go to Ole Miss. If you don't have ties to the coach, the staff, the school, I think you go where you feel like you're going to win big next year. It's, it's kind of like the Paul Skeens effect. And there's so many people that want, we want to assign blame. But in the, at the end of the day, yes, Paul Skeens got some money. But State's NIL offer was competitive in, in every aspect. But Paul Skeens had the opportunity to go play for Wes Johnson. He had the opportunity to go play for a team that looked like it was a couple of pieces away from making a serious run at Omaha. Of course, they go out and get uh, Tommy Tanks, and they go out and they get Paul Skeens, and they already had a very good nucleus of players there. And what do they do? They go win an AFL championship. It had nothing to do with Mississippi State. It had nothing to do uh, with the fact that uh, our tradition – is very rich, had nothing to do with our facilities. It had to do with the fact that there was just, in his eyes, a greater opportunity at LSU. You're seeing some of that in portal football recruiting now, too. And so we've got to close really well. And, uh, of course, you know, a few days now we'll get an announcement from Stonka Burnside. Uh, In addition to that, that, um, you know, we're still very hopeful on Daniel Hill. Um, But outside of that, there's not a lot of prep guys out there you're waiting on. You know, we've got to get guys that can make us better right now. And there are going to be some guys going go in the portal that have connections to your coaches. You're going to have some guys that when bowl games are over, uh, they're going to make a decision. And, uh, you know, there's some guys out there they are going to have to announce before their bowl games are played. You know, that, that's a part of it too. And so there will be some guys going go in the portal. And, yes, we have some money. 
yes, we have opportunity. I think it's important that let's get behind Jeff Lubby and the staff and say, okay. And uh, we're going to be there when you play Eastern Kentucky, and we're going to bring a capacity crowd, and we're going to go out there and, and really let Jeff Lubby know that we're behind him. I think the maroon and white game is going to be a big thing, too. It's going to be part of Super Bulldog Weekend, and we encourage you to be there. If you've never been to Super Bulldog Weekend, I encourage you to always turn out for that because it's a chance to be around the tribe, right? Anytime that you're on campus or in Starkville, it's a special day. Especially when you live here, it's a special day. But when you don't live here, it's an even more special day. So make plans to attend uh, Super Bulldog Weekend and come out and um, let's do some special things for that, uh, that spring game, and then we'll go pack out uh, Duty Noble Field uh, and see if we can't uh, rattle around some attendance records. But uh, I think Jeff Lebby was the right call. And I think it's important for everybody to understand that um, we had some quality candidates that we were considering. We had some quality candidates that wanted the job and pursued the job. But Zach Selman did what a lot of great leaders do. You go hire people you know and trust and people you already have a relationship with because let's be honest about this. Zach Selman doesn't want to have to keep worrying about football. You know, Zach Selman wants to be worried about, okay, I've got other sports here. I need to allocate some time and resources for them. I can't be completely engulfed with football all the time. And really, he between the baseball struggles and the football struggles, and neither of those were really on the radar when Selman first interviewed for the job. Yeah, you, know, you thought, okay, well, Mississippi State, you're after an AFL championship, end of a talent cycle. Okay, they had a tough year. They'll bounce back. He never anticipated having to make that decision. You know, he takes over, of course, after you know, Coach Leach passes away. Well, Arnett's hired. You think, okay, we're probably good there for three years. So in the very first year, he had to make two major decisions. One was keeping Chris Amonis, and one was moving on from Zach Arnett. And so he goes out and gets Jeff Labby, a guy that knows the state, knows the rivalry, knows the conference, knows Power 5 football. And so I think it's a very significant thing. And I think we're going to look back in a few years and say, you know what, that was absolutely the right decision. We should all be excited about it. All right, final segment of the show brought to you by the Stark Vegas Clubhouse. Stark Vegas Clubhouse, very easy to find. Just Google it. Stark Vegas Clubhouse, it's that simple. Five bedrooms, man. And I've toured the facility. It's fantastic. Fantastic. Renovated old uh, golf course clubhouse. And it's available to you at a very reasonable price. If you're bringing a large group to town, whether it be for a ball game or work or anything like that, rather than go out and rent five hotel rooms, why don't you stay at the Starkville Clubhouse? Have everybody under one roof. you got some common areas where everybody can, can meet or sit around, play board games, whatever you'd like to do. And better yet, it's got a full-service kitchen. So rather than you having to go out and spend all your money eating out, and listen, I'm a proponent of that, but uh, when you're going to be here for a few days, sometimes it's better to go buy some groceries, some adult beverages. They even have the full wet bar there, uh, the great fire pit area, so many amenities available. While you Google, it'll pull up their Facebook page, and you can take a virtual tour and see all those great photographs of the amenities that are available to you. Let me encourage you to book through the Evolve website. You can book through a number of hosting agencies, but if you book through Evolve, we can save you some money. Use promo code BSR10, and that gets you 10% off your stay. You need to be thinking about that. I mean, you know, that's the thing. Nowadays, rather than go stay at a hotel and hang around that lobby, and you can't catch up with everybody, and you've always got that hanger on, that stranger that tries to kind of – interject themselves into your social gathering. You don't have to deal with that, right? It gets a little too people-y out there for me sometimes. Uh, so I like to be able to kind of retreat and spend some time with the people that I care the most about, whether it be work colleagues or family or friends. The Stark Vegas Clubhouse can accommodate you. Again, book through the Evolve website, promo code BSR10. All right. Uh, so let me encourage you to, in the moments we have left, Take some time to take some inventory of your life. Uh, and really do. Not just the things that, uh, maybe the bad things that happen, but the good things that happen. And maybe write them all down. You know, there's just something empowering about writing things down. And sometimes you forget. You know, I, I think back, you know, I told you 2022 was one of the most challenging years of my life. And I got a lot done that year. But I was miserable. I really was. And, uh, you know, Dana was travel nursing, and that seemed like a good idea when we first started it. And I just found out pretty soon, pretty quickly into it, that I just wasn't built for that. 
And uh, you guys heard about that on the show. I've got some friends nowadays that still tease me about that because all's well that ends well, right? But uh, yeah, this past year, you know, I got a chance to go skiing for the first time out in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I'd never been to Santa Fe. Got to go to the uh, Loretto Chapel and see that incredible staircase that uh, defies the laws of physics. Coach Leach told me to go check that out. I did. It was incredible. Um, had a chance to go whitewater rafting this year for the first time. And I was a kid that grew up on the water. We canoed all the time. Uh, we competed in canoe races and things like that. And I've always wanted to go whitewater rafting. Had a chance to go do that uh, up in Tennessee. Uh, and so we also, you know, took the first steps on opening a new business here in Starkville. And so I say all that because it's like it's so interesting. You, know, you, you begin to say to yourself you know, that nothing ever really changes, and you look back a year later and everything is different you know, in many respects. You know, as I mentioned, you know, we added a grandchild. And, and uh, the thing that I have learned about having grandchildren is just when you think you know your capacity to love, you get a grandchild and you realize there was more in the tank than you realized. I mean, you know, love is endless, right? Uh, and many of you maybe didn't have the year that I had. I had a great year in 2023, and uh, I'm, I'm eager about 2024. I'm eager to get a new book going. Uh, but it's not just about taking an inventory, but again, it's about you know having some direction in your life. And so, okay, these are the things that I want to work on. And uh, I know every, every Facebook page and everybody out there is going to be scrolling through Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and new year, new me, but um, it's just lip service, right? So let's commit ourselves to not doing that. Uh, let's make the proclamation, but let's not call it a resolution. Let's call it an affirmed decision that I'm going to do some things differently this year. Uh, you know, I'm a guy that, uh, you know, I'm an addict, right? And so I'm a bit of a workaholic as well. And uh, I spend way too much time working. And that's one of the things that I hope to do to be a little more efficient with my time, right? To try to get some things done, uh, get up and get moving a little bit earlier in the day, and uh, with a new business opening, you know, we're going to have, um, I'm going to have to be more efficient with my time. I can't just work whenever I want to. I'm going to have to work when I can because I'm going to have to run two businesses. And uh, I'm very thankful to have a great team uh, that's a part uh, of our business here at jeanspage.com. And uh, as I told you, we had a record year. I mean, it's amazing to think about how far we've come. And um, there were so many things that I wanted to get done whenever it became my baby, and uh, it's been uh, a part of my life since 2001. I've been with Jeans Page now for almost 23 years, and uh, it's crazy to think about that. You know, it's like I, I, I begin writing articles for Gene for 50 bucks an article, and I still got a copy of that first check around here somewhere. You know, that, it's amazing to think that's how it all started, and now I own the company. And uh, there would be no company to own if you guys weren't a part of that. And so I'm very appreciative of that. And the longer that I live and the more that I experience in life, the more I appreciate people and I appreciate my friends and I appreciate people that are supporters. And, uh, you know, I wrote When the Bottom Falls this year and uh, we had to kind of be careful uh, with a limited release during the holidays because we didn't want to run out of books and we still nearly did. And so now we'll open up distribution to some other bookstores and things of that nature uh, here in the next few weeks. And uh, so if you've got a local bookstore that you think would benefit from that, uh, be sure and hit me up and I'll connect uh, our people with their people and see if we can't get some things figured out. But um, there's always another hill to climb in life. You know, there's so many times I th thought I had it all figured out and, and um, I'm always humbled, but there's always something that happens. You know, and uh, you know, on the business side of things, I've always been able to kind of roll with the punches. You know, because I know that at the end of the day, nobody's going to outwork me. There may be some people that outsmart me, but they're not going to outwork me. There may be some people that out yell me, but they're not going to outwork me. Uh, and so I know I've got a strong work ethic in that respect. And I think in, in many respects, that's part of leadership. Uh, I don't believe you can have a CEO approach and say, hey, delegate everything. You do this, you do that. I think you've got to get out in front. I think uh, I heard somebody say this years ago that a good shepherd leads their sheep. They don't drive their sheep. And... Um, there's some truth in that. And so I share these with you, you know, not just because of the fact that it's the end of the year and we all get a little nostalgic. And I can tell you every single year, every single year, uh, when 
Dana and I kiss on New Year's Eve, she always cries every single time. And uh, she is a bit of an ice queen. I think she prides herself on that. And uh, I've told her before, I don't think it's healthy. But uh, she says New Year's Eve is always so uh, melancholy for her because you think back over the year about all the things that you've accomplished and all the things that you've done and things that you've experienced. And I just think it's so important for us to understand that we're not passengers in our life, but the pilots. And um, it's just like taking on this ambitious deal about, uh, you know, the Dirty Noble book. You know, it's like I got so many people in the beginning that said, hey, it would be great, but how are you going to get this? How are you going to get that? I mean, and this guy's been dead since the 1960s, you know, so uh, you, who are you going to interview? And so fortunately, I was able to find some family, and there's not a lot of Dirty Noble family out there. Dirty and Elizabeth didn't have any children. But I got a hold of some nieces, you know, that, that uh, knew Uncle Duty. And uh, they've given me some family history. I mean, just you know, to my left over here, I've got, you know, their family history all typed up. And somebody just gave me. And uh, somebody else contacted me. They wrote a book about Mississippi College and sent me all of their reference materials for the year that Duty Noble was a coach. And I'm a firm believer in this, is that if you put your best foot forward, um, that God will honor your labor. I think when you say, hey, I'm going to do this and you work hard, that good things happen to you. I think all this stuff is just kind of floating out there in the ethos anyway. And I've heard some people in music kind of say the same things. I mean, while we may write and record these materials, uh, it's gifted to us. And, um, and so I share that with you in hopes of some moments of inspiration. Because there's so much that we get so bogged down in. You know, we get so caught up in the mundane minutia of life. Sometimes we, we overlook the beautiful times. And uh, I remember just a few days ago, we would got back from Ohio, and uh, Danny and I are laying in the bed just watching Big Bang Theory, and, and uh, I thought to myself, there is no place in the world I'd rather be than right here, right now with her. And that's not, I'm not going to make any money doing that, but it's so incredibly rewarding. You can't put a price on that. And so I'm always a firm believer in prioritizing family and prioritizing friends. Uh, but at the same time, too, you can't do it at the expense of your work, and you can't do it at the expense of the other things in your life. You have to have a certain sense of balance. And I think that's probably my biggest complaint about you know life today in America is we are so incredibly out of balance. You know, it's like, it, well, I'm going to prioritize this, and it's to the detriment of everything else in your life. And so I think having a plan makes a difference. Uh, I think it's one of those situations, too, where uh, – how do we know where we're going if we don't have a road map to get there? You know, I'm a firm believer in just kind of letting go, right? Just, you know, it's difficult for me at times. I wrote about that this morning on Facebook. It's one of those things that uh, even all these years going in sober, sometimes I have a tendency to try to hold everybody and everything in place. Okay, well, things are as I like them, so I don't want anybody to move. Well, that's just not how life works. You know, you got to be willing to let go and let people be themselves, and by the same token, people got to offer us the same courtesy. Uh, and so I just encourage you to take some time to take an inventory of your life. Uh, we get so wrapped up in the big maroon bubble. And I have people all the time, it's like, hey, have you heard about this? I'm like, no, how did I not hear about that? Well, it's because all I do 24 hours a day is focus on Mississippi State and my family. And so there are going to be some things that I miss. Sometimes you guys will share music with me. And I'm thinking, where in the world have I been? Haven't I heard this? You know? And people will share, hey, you guys got to go see this movie. I'm thinking, oh, yeah, the movies. I forgot about that. You know, um, I mentioned the other day, you know, Dana bought us a vacation to Cabo San Lucas. I always wanted to go. I've always wanted to go. And uh, hopefully we'll get to go, you know, before too terribly long. But, um, you know, we'll go. And uh, we're going to make some memories together. I'm a, I'm a firm believer, and I'd rather, have, I'd rather do things than have things. That wasn't, I wasn't always the case. You know, when I was in my 30s, I was – very materialistic you know i had to have this had to have that so i thought it made me feel better about being me well what makes me feel better about being me is going out there and doing epic things you know being able to go skiing being able to go whitewater rafting be able to go do all the things i mean i'm, I'm not just sitting around waiting to die and uh, i'm a firm believer this in this and the more that i read about the duty noble stuff and i have been relentless in my research over the course of the last uh, week and like people said i can't believe you work so hard on christmas i said well you know, what am i going to do you know i take joy in the work uh we, we we have the kids over we open guests we go to lunch uh we come home dana takes a nap and i go get on the computer and do some research for the book because i get joy from that and so i guess i could have gone and taken a nap 
but I wouldn't have got much joy from that. And so I, I share that with you just because of the fact I think it's important that uh, when you have something you're passionate about, uh, it's evident in the work that you do. And uh, reading all these old newspaper articles and uh, reading the big names of yesteryear and reading the things that they report, and uh, there was so much of it actually that was inaccurate. And uh, that's what's amazing to me too, is that this stuff was printed in a newspaper and it was completely inaccurate. Uh, that's always interesting to kind of be able to correct history in that respect. Um, I mean, even as something as simple as how many varsity letters that Duty Noble had and what year that he earned them in the sports that he did. Uh, even some of those reports out there are incorrect, and they were put in print. And to go through all these things and see like a typo in the typesetting, you know, or things of that nature. I mean, all that's been amazing to me to see all that stuff uh, because I know at the end of the day when this book is published – it's going to be the definitive history of Duty Noble because nothing else out there exists like that. And it fires me up. And then, like, I'll post something or I'll learn something and I'll call Joe Deere or I'll, I'll text Sid Salter or I'll call Dave Murray or Mike Nemeth. And they're like, oh, I never knew that. You know, uh, those are the things that excite me, to uncover things and to be able to kind of compile all this into a workable story that makes sense for all of us, but gives us something that we can be proud of. And I've had some people, some detractors of Duty Noble that have messaged me as well and said, hey, there was this situation here. And I've been able to do some research and find out many times they're wrong about what they've said, but also too to find the proper context for those stories. And we're going to frame those up as best we can. Uh, it's, it's very, 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 very interesting uh, work that we do. And uh, I'm so incredibly grateful to be in a position to be your eyes and ears. It, it is something that I take a great deal of pride in. Uh, that I, I feel that, it, hey, this is my era, right? I mean, I, I read these old guys, you know, that you know wrote for decades about Mississippi State sports, and, and, and they're dead and gone. And now here I am going back and, and rereading their work and uh, have a new appreciation for the job that they did. And uh, we're going to share so much of that with you. But this is not just about me. And about me, me writing another book. But if you had told me, you know, 10 years ago, hey, Steve, in 2024, you're going to write your seventh book, I wouldn't have believed it. I wouldn't have believed it. You can change your life. You absolutely can. And I remember when Dana and I finally made the decision to move to Starkville. I remember getting out there and working that yard and cleaning so many things up and doing all this do-it-yourself stuff and then hiring a contractor and getting the house ready for sale and uh, we moved up here even not having our house sold and just kind of on a wing and a prayer. Because uh, I'm a firm believer that scared money doesn't make any money. And I remember thinking then, you know, the greatest lesson that I have taught my children is that you can change your life easy as, as an adult. You know, we packed up and moved everybody up here, you know. And uh, now we have three graduates from Starkville High School, which is something that, uh, that makes me very proud. And uh, they were part of uh, some great classes that saw some state championships, you know. Uh, those are great high school memories. Uh, but one of the greatest messages that I ever received was my daughter, Mia, who, as you guys know, won 10 NAFL championships as a speech and debater at Mississippi State. Before she got there, Mississippi State had won zero, and she won 10. She's the most decorated speech and debate student, not just at Mississippi State, but in the country. And so when you begin to think about that, there's a great deal of pride that goes with that. And she just texted me out of the blue one day, and she said, you know, one of the reasons that we all do what we do is because we watched you and Mama do it. We watched you and Mama do something great with your life. And uh, that's the greatest compliment from the greatest source, right? Your children. Just know that somewhere along the way that I did something right. And so whether you have children, whether you're new to parenthood, whether you have old adult children or whatever, uh, you're never too old to stop teaching them. There's always a lesson that can be learned because no matter what you think or what you, what you feel, your children and other people are always watching you to see how to act and how to react. And when negative things happen in life, I think it's important. Uh, that's when we are probably on the biggest stage of all with our families to kind of lead them. And I think that's very, very important. And so I spent a lot of time talking about this, and uh, I just want to end the year, our final show of the year, uh, with something that maybe you can hang on to. You know, again, it wasn't a great year for Mississippi State Athletics. It was a great year for me personally. It's a great year for me professionally. And so I hope that we can get all the horses pulled in the same direction next year because uh, I believe baseball is going to be better. I think basketball is going to have uh, uh, a lot to cheer about here in the months ahead. 
And then I think we're going to have a lot next year in football to be proud of too. But, again, as I cautioned yesterday, let's have a little patience, you know. Uh, Mississippi State people, we have a true grit about us. We really do. And uh, we've got some people out there we always have for generations upon generations or generations uh, to think they know better. But the reality of it is all of that comes from a good place. We all want Mississippi State to be successful. And I think it's important to have patience with each other. And I think that's one thing that the maturity has taught me is, number one, I'm okay with you being wrong. But I'm also learning to be okay with me being wrong. Right. At times there are sometimes I just may have the wrong take. And that's OK. We're all human. We all you know, that's part of the deal. Uh, but I think it's important that we as a fan base kind of unite together and put our differences aside and let's support uh, Mississippi State Athletics in every aspect. And, uh, you know, if you've got money to give, I encourage you to give. Uh, if you have thought about being a season ticket holder before, but have never done it, I'm going to encourage you to do that, you know. Uh, let's do something different this year, and let's make 2024 even better for all of us, uh, not just with sports, but with uh, you know, personal and professional type stuff. And I have so many people that have said, Steve, the greatest thing I've ever heard you say is don't ever get too busy to pack the car and take the kids somewhere. And it's true. You know, my greatest memories have not been stories that I've written. That's true. You know, and, uh, I've, you know, I've sold tens of thousands of books and I have all these great book signings. But I'll tell you, the things that mean the most to me late at night when I'm, wind, when I'm winding down are the fact that I did so many amazing things with my wife and kids. And so many times that I pack the car and bring, you know, Ani to a ball game or, or take the kids on the road to go see Mississippi State play a road game. And they got to kind of see how other schools operate. And those are precious memories for us. I mean, it's not just the Disney trips, Right. You know, it's all those trips to go seeing the Bulldogs play and coming home and talking about the game the whole way back home. Uh, those are the things that sustain me. And uh, I'm sure many of you feel the same way. So let's make as many of those memories as we can in 2024 because there's going to come a time that we're not going to be able to do that. Let's, let's take advantage of that while we can. And I can assure you, you're never, ever, 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 ever going to regret packing a car and taking a kid somewhere. You, you may in the moment – you know, because somebody wants to go to the bathroom or you know, somebody needs a snack or whatever. There's always something. There's always some encumbrance with travel, right? Uh, but the reality of it is those memories are priceless. And um, last thing I'm going to tell you about all this, because I know uh, some people are like, well, Steve, you're preaching. We're not, we're not going to pass around an offering plate or hum just as I am. But I'll tell you this. The people that matter are the people that will gather around your bedside in your final days. It's not going to be your friends from work. It's not going to be your friends from church. It's not even going to be your hun buddies or people like that. It's not, going to, it's, not, it's, not, it's not that those relationships are insignificant. But the priority should always be on the people that will be there with you in your final moments. And I think it's important to be with them as many moments as you can until that day gets here. Until next time, let's all live our lives in a way we make more friends and enemies and people can see a difference in the way we live.